Dialectic of Defeat, Contours of Western Marxism by Russell Jacoby. Chapter 6, Class Unconsciousness. The monotony of defeat and self-destruction compelled Western Marxists to reevaluate the relationship of history and nature. Initially, they kept distant from the natural sciences for devaluing the new and unique in history. This devaluation condemned Marxism to improving, not undoing, the past. Yet the uniform defeat of the European revolutions and the barbarism of fascism exacted a toll. The hope of a liberating breakthrough dimmed. Moreover, Marxists were not only victims, but victimizers. To Walter Benjamin's words that the bourgeoisie never ceased to be, to be victorious could be added, Marxists never cease to bury each other and the revolution. The subordination of history to bleak repetition tempered the efforts to rescue it from nature. The Western Marxists, especially the theorists of the Frankfurt School, adopted a negative vision of nature. This vision is not to be confused with the classic ethos of entrepreneurial capitalism, which eyed nature only as stuff to be exploited and subdued. Rather, nature, even before and outside of human exploitation, was racked by violence and pain. Nature mutely testified to ceaseless horror, perpetual cycles of silent suffering. Nature and natural lost their benign and innocent quality. The natural in nature was also violent and unnatural. Big fish eat little fish, although Marcuse noted dryly, it may not seem natural to the little fish. History harbored a hope to escape from the eternal repetition of nature, and even in its most utopian formulations, to liberate nature. The creatures too must become free, said Marx, citing Thomas Munzer. Unnoticed by the scientific Marxists, the negative vision of nature informed Marx and Engels' ideas of the natural laws of capitalism. They derided the myth of a serene and happy nature. Instead, open warfare and the bitterest competition suffused nature. The laws of nature reflected its unfreedom, the dominion of perpetual repetition. What Marx wrote of his own method, it examined social movements as processes of natural history, derived from this interpretation of nature. History could be treated as natural, subjugated to natural laws, exactly to the degree that it was unfree and repetitious. The laws of history were tokens of the absence of freedom and consciousness. Engels wrote that the natural laws of capitalism were based on the unconscious of the participants. The earliest writings of the Frankfurt School re-examined the relationship of history and nature. Marcuse noted in 1930 that the posthumous publication of the Dialectics of Nature justified Lucas's polemic against Engels because Engels' book clearly demonstrated the super superficiality of a dialectic of nature. If Marcuse subscribed to Lucas's formulations on the duality of nature, Adorno challenged the conventional antithesis of nature and history. Critical thoughts surmounted this antithesis. Adorno wrote in The Idea of Natural History in 1932 and examined the interpretation of nature and history. Historical being must be pursued to the point where it devolves into nature. Conversely, where nature seems most natural, most completely itself, its historical dynamic must be disclosed. To execute this project, Adorno retrieved the concept of second nature. <clears throat> The concept of second nature recurred throughout the writings of the Frankfurt School. According to Horkheimer, it originated in Democritus, who protested Aristotle's belief that the qualification to rule or serve was determined at birth by nature. Democritus argued that the qualification was informed by education, which constituted a second nature. Although the concept was known to Hegel and other thinkers, it assumed a decisive importance for Lucas. Second nature encompassed the social world of the bourgeoisie, a rigid and strange universe, the charnel house of long dead interiorities. 
Second Nature expressed and compressed the paradox of capitalism, which decimated the natural relations of feudalism to fabricate new natural relations. The bourgeoisie fought under the banner of natural rights and laws. The belief that private property and capitalism itself accorded with nature served as a powerful weapon. The illusion of its natural arrangement ordained capitalism for perpetuity. Second nature was not biology, but history that congealed into nature. It congealed because it was imprisoned in the dungeons of repetition. Second nature signified the dialectic of history, which was not a dialectic, but a dynamic of ineluctable cycles. The vocabulary of natural laws and Marx bespoke more accurately a vocabulary of second nature. Insofar as determinism and necessity dominated history and nature, the laws of nature and history converged. They registered the lack of choice. To the point that there were natural laws of history, history was unliberated, a second nature. Society is irrational, wrote Marcuse, precisely in that it is governed by natural laws. Yet the distinction between first and second nature cannot be lost. The Western Marxists did not soften their opposition to a dialectic of nature. This dialectic obliterated the differences between nature and history. Second nature as frozen history was still a product of humanity, whereas nature was not. The blind and fateful laws of history were ultimately grounded in human institutions. This was the difference, as Marx noted, between the work of a bee and the work of a man. The latter included conscious purpose. History was and was not natural. It was historical because it was made by men and women who consciously and freely controlled their actions. It was natural because it was still enacted unconsciously. It still participated in recurring cycles of suffering that were intrinsic to nature, but extrinsic to history. The natural laws of history, wrote Adorno, are ideologies so far as they are hypostasized as unchangeable givens of nature but they are real as the law of movement of the unconscious society. The idea of the unconscious society was familiar to Lucas, but in history and class consciousness, it was closely associated with reification. Reification was a form of unconsciousness, a form specific to capitalism. The capitalist commodity structured the consciousness of society by burying the human and historical relations under neutral and quantitative relations. This was the primal bourgeois myth that repelled insight. The activity of labor appeared as an exchange of equivalencies. Yet to speak of reification was also to speak of class consciousness. The power of Lucas's analysis rested not simply on charting the parameters of reification, but in plotting its dissolution by a class conscious proletariat. The concept of second nature did not replace reification but the Frankfurt School's preference for it incorporated several decades of historical experience. Between History and Class Consciousness, 1923, and Adorno's and Horkheimer's The Dialectic of Enlightenment, 1947, lay too many cemeteries. Second Nature recorded the defeats and the doubts. It testified to an unfreedom that preceded and perhaps survived capitalism. Nor did second nature, like reification, infer the imminence of class consciousness. In an, in an abridged formulation, reification was the unconsciousness specific to capitalism, or reification was the capitalist form of second nature. Second nature was the form of unconsciousness of an unliberated humanity. To shift from reification to second nature, from class consciousness to class unconsciousness, threatens the concreteness of Marxism. History may be bartered for abstractions, yet abstractions are not inevitably neutral and blank. Marx incisively demonstrated the opposite. The effacement of diversity is not natural. It testifies to historical violence. The loss of specificity is specific to advanced societies. The most general abstractions arise only in the midst of the richest possible concrete development when one thing appears common to many, to all. 
Class unconsciousness is not simply class unconsciousness. It is the ingredient and product of historical forces and institutions. It requires a theory that goes beyond its borders. Class unconsciousness cannot simply be explained by itself, by its own internal logic or illogic, as if classes lacked insight because of the absence of consciousness. To remain locked within its borders is to ignore that class consciousness refers to a class and that class refers finally to men and women enmeshed in social relations. The fact of class unconsciousness is not new to Marxists. In the 1890s, the emergence of revisionism and reformism, reformism within Marxist parties challenged theorists of various stripes. Visible and invisible reformism jettisoned the revolutionary vocabulary and goals of Marxism for incremental changes. For contemporary observers, Marxists and non-Marxists, the task was not simply to refute revisionism, but to explain its diffusion. The term class unconsciousness was not adopted, but the theorists grappled with a similar problem to explain why sectors of the working class did not gravitate toward revolution, but toward reformism, jingoism, and militarism. Observers sought an explanation not of the formation, but of the siphoning off of class consciousness. The German Social Democrats, SPD, by far the largest Marxist party, expressed the tendencies of reformism most dramatically and often served as the locus of examination. The explanation of a broad reformism in the SPD covered the spectrum from its class composition to its psychological character. Those outside or against the dominant Marxist parties frequently advanced the most compelling hypotheses. Those inside tended to discount the phenomenon, attributing it to marginal factors. Although these theories cannot be accepted almost a century later, no reformulation of class unconsciousness can afford to ignore them. Little agreement existed on reformism. The facts were clear, but the first conceptual step prompted disputes. How did one measure revolutionary class consciousness or its absence? Did its public spokesmen represent more profound invisible sentiments or nothing more than themselves? How did one evaluate massive votes for the Marxists or the party itself in relation to the class? Did reformism of the former imply reformism of the latter? Did the social composition of the party differ from the class? If so, did it matter? To many French and Italian observers, reformism seemed exclusively rooted in the German party and character. Charles Andler, who had previously announced the decomposition of Marxism, charged in 1912 that the German party, in surrendering to colonialism, militarism, perhaps capitalism, was imperialist by instinct. Others aired similar suspicions. The Dutch anarchist Ferdinand Nuenis raised the specter of the Germanization of the working class movement in his Socialism in Danger, 1897. He characterized German socialism as authoritarian and bureaucratic, Robert Michel, the greatest observer and critic of German socialism, agreed that the Germany hegemony of international socialism threatened to spread verbal radicalism and factual opportunism. If ignored by orthodox Marxists, the anarchist critiques of the German social democrats were often prescient. Nuenis discerned the discipline and slavishness that infused the social democrats conceding that discipline was necessary. He noted that at a certain point, it vitiated autonomy and independence. Moreover, the party organization itself created a layer of dependence less interested in revolution than job security, an idea Michel later expanded upon. The Polish revolutionary Jan W. Mikajski advanced a provocative critique of Marxism on Marxist grounds. For Mikajski, European social democracy was composed of a new class of intellectual workers. This class was less committed to transferring the wealth of capitalism to the proletariat than intensifying capitalist development. 
the Kachsky discerned the ethos of industrialism that imbued Marxism, eclipsing a revolutionary consciousness. Marxist doctrine preaches class struggle only against a handful of plutocrats, but harbors the most sentimental affection for the progress of bourgeois society. Marxists fetishize productivity in the name of science in order to justify their own class position. That the Social Democrats allowed or encouraged bourgeois adherents offered an explanation for the weakening of class consciousness and the growth of revisionism. This line of, an, of analysis was pursued by both anarchists and conservative sociologists. An internal opposition, Di Jungin, or Di Dai Youngin, to the SPD mounted this critique. They argued that the party had been deproletarianized by an influx of petty bourgeois elements that controlled the leadership. Some sociologists drew similar conclusions from the massive votes for the SPD. They attributed the votes not simply to the proletariat, but to the bourgeoisie voting for the working class party, which was no longer the party of the working class. The two most forceful and coherent statements approach reform, for reformism from opposite directions. According to the theory of the aristocracy of labor, a segment of the working class, by virtue of high wages, lost interest in revolution and gravitated toward opportunism. In one form or another, this theory entered the lexicon of orthodox Marxism, providing a materialist explanation of persistent reformism. The other approach delves less into the composition of the class than into the composition of the proletarian party. It argued that as the party of the proletariat swelled into a bureaucracy, it smothered revolutionary consciousness. Engels informally employed the theory of labor aristocracy to explain the passivity of the English working class. Later, Lenin's imperialism approved it for orthodox Marxism. The super profits of imperialism allowed some countries to bribe and corrupt a segment of the working class by high wages. Opportunism and revisionism were rooted in this economic reality. More recently, Arguerre Emmanuel enlarged the theory to include the entire working class of the advanced capitalist countries. To explain a historical fact that has endured for nearly a century by the corruption of the leaders and the deception of the masses is, to say the least, hardly in conformity with the method of historical materialism. It is not the conservatism of the leaders that has held back the revolutionary elan of the masses. It is the slow but steady growth in awareness by the masses that they belong to privileged exploiting nations. The attraction of the theory of labor aristocracy resides in its dissatisfaction with ad hoc explanations of reformism. It insists on the basic economic relations, yet this insistence is also a weakness. The theory corrodes into economic reductionism already visible in Emmanuel's analysis. The concept is distended until it loses coherence. The absence of class consciousness is a flat economic fact. The inadequacy of a theory of labor arist aristocracy is evinced by its counter logic. It implicitly postulates that non aristocratic working class is revolutionary. The labor aristocracy theory is inextricably linked to its opposite, the theory of emisceration. Despite and because of all discussions on the subject, it is difficult to maintain that a relatively or absolutely impoverished working class is automatically revolutionary. Insofar as the labor aristocracy emissorations theories translate bald economic relations directly into class consciousness or its absence, they remove a linchpin of Western Marxism and return to orthodoxy. Michel in Political Parties offered an incomparable phenomenolo phenomenology of reformism in the SPD. To be sure, he was finally less interested in the Marxist parties than in a general theory of organization. The former was simply proof and example of the latter. Nonetheless, 
<clears throat> his texts remain suggestive and ignored by Marxists. The tendency was to judge him instantly obsolete or ac applicable only to competing parties. In 1928, Lucas reviewed the second edition of Political Parties. He tried to write off Michel as only applicable to the SPD. Michel did not illuminate the dissipation, dissipation of class consciousness. Rather, he was both a victim and expression of social democratic revisionism. The theory of labor aristocracy served to refute Michel. He wants to give a general sociology of party life, and he gives at best a descriptive presentation of the development of opportunism and social democracy in the imperialist period under the influence of the rise and growth of the aristocracy of labor. Lucas judged severely. Michel was worthless. Yet Michel may have the last word. The histories of the communist parties in and out of power do not simply refute Michel. The struggle carried on by the soci socialists against the parties of the dominant classes, announced Michel, is no longer one of principle, but simply one of competition. The revolutionary party has become a rival of the bourgeois parties for the conquest of power. The international labor movement, increasingly inert as the strength of its organization grows, loses its revolutionary impetus. It becomes sluggish, not in respect of action alone, but also in the sphere of thought. According to Michel, the revolutionary organization, ever greedy for new members, fattens from the means into the goal. The qualities initially required to facilitate the revolution, subordination, cooperation, discretion, propriety of conduct, serve to consolidate the organization. Yet Michel did not simply provide a justification for the renunciation of revolution. The physion physiognomy of explicit reformism did not escape his eye. In a telling phrase, he labeled reformism the socialism of non-socialists with a socialist past. A theory of class unconsciousness remains unwritten and is perhaps unwritable. It may circumscribe too many historical experiences in disconnected situations. Yet to lose the phenomenon by a series of discrete explanations sabotages a critical Marxism. The absence of class consciousness is, is explained away by working class aristocracy, nationalism, racism, and so on. These partial explanations may be akin to pre-Copernican astronomy. Each new sighting is fit into an essentially false map by adding circles. The point, however, is to reconceive the entire endeavor. In recent years, efforts, ha efforts have been renewed to rethink the weakness, absence, or quiescence of class consciousness. Theories of mass culture, advertising, affluence, and legitimization, to name just several, have taken their place beside older approaches of labor aristocracy, nationalism, and racism. That they remain partial does not mean they are inaccurate, nor that they suffice. Non-Marxists tend to multiply the factors until the phenomenon dissip dissipates in a cloud of graphs and charts, and Marxists veer between ad hoc explanations that write off the reality and a reductionism that tags behind that tags behind it or legs behind it. Either works. The identification of class consciousness with success and its absence with defeat has not lost its allure. It has encouraged the imitation of successful political struggles. Yet a defeat is not identical to the absence of class consciousness, nor is a silent class necessarily an unconscious one. The gun and the rack are tried and true means to quiet an unruly class. This should not be minimized. Crowded prisons and morgues from South Africa to Paraguay testify that this remains a favorite tool of authoritarian power. Nevertheless, the power of society passes beyond deadly violence. It dwells within social and human relations. An obedient class eyes not only the security police, but its social security and health benefits. Acceptance and political withdrawal may not only be encouraged and commanded, but also inbred, a second nature. 
If tomorrow the economic order disintegrates, the revolutionary class may rally to the reaction. The myth that the proletariat is simply biding its time, that despite all appearances it is revolutionary in heart and mind, has drugged Marxists for too long. The mystique of success generates the fiction of defeat. Setbacks and losses are chalked off as unreal or momentary. The absence of class consciousness is a ploy, an illusion of bourgeois commentators or the excuse of rootless intellectuals or it is ascribed to a combination of factors that cannot endure. The orthodoxy is preserved by belittling the phenomenon, deferring to the myth of a steadily growing class conscious proletariat. Endless studies on income level and positions in the class structure participate in this myth. The boldest Hegelians would be shamed by the Marxists arguing that the proletariat has enlarged as an economic reality, but momentarily shrunk as a political presence. The complete disjunction between the economic reality and the political appearance cannot be sustained interminably. At a certain point, the absence of a political and class consciousness forces a reconsideration of its economic and extra economic sources. Class unconsciousness cannot be explained simply by false consciousness or by a fatter paycheck. The dialectic trick is to keep everything in view. A one-eyed theory of class unconsciousness is still half blind. A final and significant objection. A theory of class unconsciousness simply reverses all the bad Hegelianism of Lucas. Theories of class unconsciousness or consciousness are remnants of a Hegelianism that cannot be proved. Neither classes nor groups attain consciousness. A valid social theory must simply dispense with the idea of historical consciousness or unconsciousness. There is no convincing response to this objection. Logic is threadbare here. Instances can be matched against counter instances, and doubtlessly the cases of decisive class consciousness are as frequent as the happy pages of history. The argument does not rest on frequency, however. A single instance suffices. It rests on a theory of the historical process. Even the darkest theories of class unconsciousness are grounded in an idea of humanity creating itself, no longer victim but subject of history. In the recesses of the blackest pessimism pulsates a secret optimism.